The Minuteman 1 ICBM, or Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, was a globe-spanning nuclear weapon with nearly 10 times the destructive yield of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War. And in 1974, America successfully launched one out the back of an airborne C-5 galaxy. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. As if lobbing an 87,000-pound nuclear payload out the back of an aircraft in flight wasn't a dramatic enough undertaking in itself, the team responsible for history's only air-launched ICBM were also under a strict deadline and potentially apocalyptic pressure. While their efforts could have resulted in a new approach to leveraging America's nuclear arsenal, actually fielding a new capability might not have really been the aim of their program. Instead, the whole effort may have really been about sending a message to the Soviet Union before entering into a new round of nuclear disarmament talks. You see, nuclear posturing had really become an integral facet of the ideological conflict between the American and Soviet governments by 1974, with each nation working tirelessly to field new means of leveraging or delivering atomic and then thermonuclear weapons. The U.S. took the technological lead, fielding a massive arsenal of advanced weapons for their time, but what the Soviet juggernaut lacked in scientific accomplishment, it made up for in volume. By 1974, the Soviet Union had all but eliminated America's technological advantage by simply fielding more of their slightly less advanced weapons. But the truth is, the number of warheads in each nation's respective armories didn't really matter by the time Secretary of State Henry Kissinger began coordinating with his Soviet counterpart for the 1974 Strategic Arms Limitations Talks, or SALT. If America and the Soviet Union were to go to war, the collective onslaught of their two arsenals would be more than enough to destroy life as we knew it, and this understanding, known as mutually assured destruction, has been credited by some as the selfish cynicism that has, thus far, saved the world, with each nation knowing that to incite a nuclear war would be to invite one's own destruction. But MAD is predicated on maintaining that destructive balance between states, and in the 70s, the U.S. had grown really concerned that MAD's equilibrium was beginning to give way. America had long since transitioned to leaning on ICBMs as their primary means of nuclear weapons delivery. But America's Minuteman silos were stationary targets with known locations that the Soviets could feasibly target in a first-strike offensive. If the Soviets were to wipe out America's silo-based nuclear weapons, it would be very difficult for the U.S. to hold up the mutual part of the world's assured destruction, which in no uncertain terms meant the Soviets had an advantage. Kissinger needed to rebalance the nuclear scales before the next round of talks could take place, and it fell to the men of the Aeronautical Systems Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to do it. The problem was, if the Soviets knew where the ICBM silos were, then the missiles needed to be moved and then launched from new locations. But how do you do that? Well, it wasn't long before someone brought up the idea of using America's massive new cargo transport aircraft, the C-5 Galaxy. It was indeed a crazy idea, but crazy wasn't all that uncommon throughout the Cold War. You see, carrying massive payloads was literally baked into the C-5's DNA right from the start. It was born out of the Air Force's CX-LHS program, which was aimed at fielding an aircraft large and powerful enough to carry things like America's newest tanks at the time, the 30-foot-long, 50-ton M60 Patton. When they were done building the C-5, they had an aircraft that could carry two of them, 5,300 miles, without refueling. We're talking about a plane with 34,734 cubic feet of cargo space. I mean, the cargo bay itself stretches further than the entire distance of the Wright brothers' first flight at 121 feet. But maybe most astonishing of all, the C-5 could carry more than 120,000 pounds inside that massive cavity and still get off the ground. That's nearly twice the payload of the B-52 bomber, or three times that of America's stealth-heavy payload bomber, the B-2 Spirit. 
So technically speaking, 87,000 pounds of ICBM and its accompanying gear would be a walk in the park for the mighty galaxy, but there was more to it than just getting it off the ground. In order to give Kissinger the edge he needed, they had to prove that they could drop the missile and have it launch after the cargo plane released it. With just 90 days before the SALT talks were set to begin, the Air Force's Space and Missile Systems Office quickly gathered a slew of engineers, aviators, and subject matter experts from within the military and beyond. The group immediately set to work, poring over the C-5 Galaxy and the Minuteman 1 schematics, looking for reasons that the concept could work or reasons why it couldn't. The most conspicuous challenge was the drop itself. The C-5 had already dropped loads as heavy as 164,000 pounds in the past, but those loads had always been divided into four drops, limiting each one to around 41,000 pounds. And while a large drop might measure 28 feet under normal circumstances, the 87,000 pound Minuteman 1 payload, including its sled, with its three-stage rocket engines, guidance control section, and re-entry vehicle, stretched over 57 feet. If the chutes failed to successfully drag the load all the way out of the aircraft, the C-5 would become unbalanced and uncontrollable, resulting in a crash. If because of the length of the missile, the nose dipped too quickly and the back of it caught the top of the C-5 on its way out, the aircraft would again become unbalanced and crash. The only way this could work is if everything went exactly according to plan. Under normal circumstances, this kind of dangerous enterprise would have called for a slower and more methodical approach, but there just wasn't time for that. And as testing began and failures started to occur, the program pushed ahead anyway. A total of 10 test flights were planned, with the first seven dedicated to deploying increasingly heavier and longer payloads, with the final three set aside for real missiles, only the last of which would actually ignite its first stage engine. And while none of the dropped missiles would actually be carrying a nuclear warhead, the task was still fraught with danger for the crew in the unpressurized rear cabin, running alongside 43,500 tons of actual Armageddon. In fact, they had to wear personal oxygen tanks to withstand the thin air as they prepared the payloads for deployment, and at least once they had to resort to emergency measures to get the payload clear of the aircraft. In order to ensure the C-5 survived launching an ICBM, it would deploy the weapon at an altitude of 20,000 feet, using parachutes attached to its nose to orient it upwards. As the missile left the aircraft, a timed fuse on the first stage motor would begin a countdown, igniting the missile's engine as it reached about 8,000 feet, arresting its downward momentum and sending the continent-spanning weapon off to its far-flung target. For the purposes of the test, however, only the first stage engine would fire, just as a proof of concept. On September 6th, 1974, the first drop test of a 45,000 pound payload was successful, with the second success just four days later. Their next test with a 54,000 pound payload would set a new world record, that is, until the following test with a 66,000 pound drop. That test, however, ended in failure, as the platform tore through the recovery parachutes and allowed the load to free fall to the ground. After some adjustments, they moved on to an 87,320-pound platform payload, a total weight even heavier than the missile and the platform to come. And unfortunately, that test was nearly a catastrophic failure. The 32-foot extraction parachute failed to pull the load cleanly from the aircraft, leaving it not quite stuck, but moving very slowly hanging out the back, creating exactly the sort of dangerous situation the aircrew knew would lead to a crash. Fortunately, they were able to take emergency measures, and the platform eventually fell clear, but it had been the second failure in just six drops a 33% failure rate, with one of those failures during the only test with a similarly weighted payload to a real missile, might have been enough to prompt a bit of further testing in most circumstances, but time was running out. So the team decided to move forward to missile testing, adding a second 32-foot extraction parachute to hopefully resolve the problem. On October 24th, 1974, one month before the talks were set to continue and one month after the nearly disastrous payload test, a C-5 left the runway at Hill Air Force Base with 13 men and one live Minuteman 1 ICBM on board. 
In the back, Chief Master Sergeant Elmer Hardin and Senior Master Sergeant Jim Sims wore their personal oxygen tanks and sat on either side of the 56-foot missile as the C-5 soared out over the Pacific. At eight minutes before the drop, the rear cargo bay doors opened, exposing the nose of the missile to the high-altitude Pacific air. Sims pulled the safety plug from the Minuteman and replaced it with a green one to indicate that the weapon was armed to fire. As the countdown approached zero, he armed the locks that would release the missile from its sled-like cradle just as it prepared to ignite its engines. When the clock did hit zero, the two 32-foot parachutes deployed and smooth as can be pulled the 87,000-pound ICBM and sled from the C-5 as though it was what the aircraft was always meant to do. I'll quote Sims here. It was like dumping out a wheelbarrow full of water. We gained some forward motion, but the pilots had control of it. It was very smooth. The two men walked to the edge of the loading ramp, watching the massive missile drop held upright by a bouquet of parachutes struggling against its weight. And for an instant, they worried the missile's engine wouldn't fire as it continued to fall some 12,000 feet. But then they saw a flash of light emerge from beneath the ICBM. I'll quote Harden this time. I saw it fire. All at once there was a big ball of fire. That burn stopped the missile from falling and it came straight up. We were at 20,000 feet and it passed us. It looked like a giant pencil. It was pretty amazing to see. The first stage engine of the Minuteman 1 screamed through the sky to 30,000 feet, 10,000 feet above the C-5 as it flew away. Then the missile's second stage would usually fire to continue the weapon's trajectory, but the burn ended and the missile fell safely into the Pacific. They had done it, and according to Sims and Hardin, they were even briefed that Kissinger felt he'd been given the advantage he needed as America went into these talks with the Soviets. The following year, two Air Force Aeronautical Systems Division's engineers would submit an academic paper that used the data collected from the tests to confirm the viability of air-launched ICBMs. And even more astonishing, they claimed that the C-5 could potentially launch multiple missiles in a single flight, which could be possible considering the aircraft's massive payload capabilities. Today's C-5M Super Galaxy, in fact, can carry payloads of upwards of 285,000 pounds. That's enough to carry three modern Minuteman III ICBMs at once, if this concept were ever put into service, that is. But that may be why this program, despite being considered a success, was quietly shelved after the conclusion of the 1974 summit. What was meant by the Americans to be a second-strike fail-safe capability to eliminate a Soviet advantage had produced an incredibly daunting first-strike capability the Soviets couldn't counter. Both nations were aware that tipping the scales of mutually assured destruction too far in one nation's favor threatened to topple the doctrine altogether and could potentially even lead to war. Maybe that's why this concept never went any further than one successful test. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to tap like and subscribe and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.